If you would, grab your Bibles tonight for our study in Galatians. Thank you so much for being here. So grateful for that. And uh, how many of you do not have to work tomorrow? Raise your hand. <laughs> Nathan rose, raised his hand back there. Nathan, you ain't got no job, man. How many of you weren't going to work tomorrow because... You didn't have a job to work anyway, so you were just off. You're just off. <laughs> we got a church full of off people. That's good. Well, if you don't have to work tomorrow, awesome. If you do, I'm sorry, but um, um, maybe you'll have another day off this week. But we're glad that you're here tonight anyway. The book of Galatians, if you don't mind, that's where we're going to be. And we're studying through this book. If you came in tonight and you aren't used to our study and um, no one's required to get it, um, but if you'd like a handout to follow through um, with, raise your hand and one of our guys will bring you a handout. Um, Fourteen people, no, there's a few people over here. Um, give those folks a handout. And uh, Peyton, won't you get up and help there, son? Uh, use those young legs for the Lord. Nope, that's the wrong direction. This way, bud. They're over here. And uh, see if you can help run those around if they need it. Galatians chapter 1. And uh, we're, we've done verses 1 and 2 and 3. We'll, we'll read through those in just a moment. Then we'll pick up in verse 4 and uh, get as far as we can. We're not, we're not in any hurry by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we're just wanting to study the Bible. Um, we believe in setting the scriptures and allow them to feed us and to grow us. You know, there's only, uh, people often ask, uh, why, why study the Bible? Um, it, it's not for facts. It's not for that type of reason. Uh, actually, studying the scriptures is what produces holiness. I don't know if you know that, um, but you being saved did not produce immediate holiness in you um, or me. Uh, being saved doesn't produce that. I wish that was the case. That is not the case. What produces holiness? Be ye renewed by the transforming of your mind. What is that? All this stuff that's up in here that's been implanted through my flesh and through my selfish and sinful choices um, has to be renewed. It has to be replaced. Replaced with what? replaced with the Word of God. And so as you study the Scriptures, what it does for a believer, and this is just one of the things, what it does for the believer is renew them. You do know the Scriptures that the Bible the, says in 2 Timothy that the Bible is written, um, and it's written by the holy inspiration of God. It was God-breathed. God spoke this Word. While He used human instrumentation... It is still, nonetheless, uh, His Word to us. And His Word reproves, uh, rebukes, right? It corrects, it instructs. It is the teaching of God's Word that the man of God, the person of God, the Bible says may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, my friend, I didn't get that as soon as, as soon as I got saved. Neither did you. This is a process that happens. This is what the Word of God does as you get in it and as it gets in you. What does it do? It equips you and it matures you into a faithful, committed follower of Jesus Christ. That's what the Word of God does. And the Apostle Paul here in his letter to the Galatians, he is defending the Word of God. He is defending the truth of God. He's not out there with swords or guns, defending in that or putting on his boxing gloves. He, it's not that type of defending. He's defending the spiritual uh, uh, truthfulness of God's Word and what it does to a believer because the opposite of truth is a lie. The opposite of uh, good sound teaching is false teaching. And that's what was happened here. And um, we know that Paul 
received his authorship, his apostleship, by divine revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul starts off defending his apostleship in verses 1 and 2. Look at it. Paul, an apostle, not of men. So already we know that he didn't get this from some um, human instrumentation of teaching, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Uh, uh, Paul didn't get this from the disciples. He didn't get this from, and by the way, Paul um, studied under some incredible teachers. Um, Paul was a very intelligent man. Uh, uh, it, it, he was very versed in culture. He was very versed in his, uh, um, his ethnic, uh, ethnicity, if you will. He was, he was, the Bible says he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Um, the Bible lets us know that this was an educated man. He was very intelligent. Um, um, I, if there would have been PhDs in the day, he would have had that. Uh, no doubt about that. But Paul says, look, what I'm giving to you, these letters that I have written, this book that I have written, Galatian, uh, Galatia, uh, to the uh, churches of Galatia, is by divine authorship of Jesus Christ. I didn't get this from anyone else. Paul is proving to us his apostleship, and we know by studying Paul out that Paul is our apostle. And, and Paul is defending against the era of legalism here. This whole performance-based religious system that goes on, and by the way, we know this is very even prevalent today. And, and so Paul is defending that. And, and there were false teachers that were coming in behind Paul's ministry. And notice his audience, verse 2. Because we've already studied this, but this is just a little warm-up for you tonight. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. He isn't writing to one specific church. When Paul wrote his letters, Paul wrote these letters to churches or individuals. This is one of the books that he wrote to a group of churches. This is not just one church. What happened here, Paul would have written this letter and they would have shared this letter amongst those churches. And so it would be somebody like me getting up and reading a letter from the Apostle Paul. Man, that would have been fantastic in the day. Uh, and we're getting to read it today, so it's been passed down, it's been preserved. I believe God has preserved His Word, amen? That's the infallibility of His holy scriptures. I thank God for that. So, while we are not reading it in its original le letters, and its original text, because no one has those, all right? We are trusting what God has done to preserve His Word so today, tonight, it is as if we are reading Paul's letter directly. And that's what we're doing. This is precious. I don't believe sometimes Christians realize how wonderful their Bible truly is. You can take a step back and look at this as from the perspective, you know, I'm getting it directly just like they did. And I believe that. I don't believe that God has changed or allowed his book to be changed. While words have most definitely been changed and translated uh, into the English language, because that's not how it was originally written. We know all of that. Here's the thing. It has not changed the meaning of it. Are you with me now? While words change... It does not change the impact of God's Word because if you do that, then you absolutely remove the infallibility of His Word. You remove the preservation of the Word. And I'm going to tell you something else you do when you change God's Word. You change the illumination of God's Word. What is that, Pastor Larry? That's the power of God's Word. See, folks... We need the power of his word. We don't need men's words. Not in the wisdom of man's words that you receive this, but in the power of God. That's his word. And so what is Paul doing? 
He is standing against all the gainsayers. He is standing against all those who want to say something outside of the Scriptures that has been passed down. And that's what he's doing. You know, he is trying to make sure that this, these churches, and by the way, this church, is rooted and established and grounded and not moved away from the message of grace. Look at verse 3. Grace. Everyone say grace. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, what a wonderful theme. What a wonderful thing. Chapters 1 and 2, by the way, are the whole defense uh, in, in this book of Paul's apostleship and the whole thing of grace. It's a defense of that. Chapters 1 and 2, then 3 and 4 or something else, and then 5 and 6. We'll talk about that later. Uh, this, this whole book is divided really up into three sections, two chapters each. And Paul's defending this. And he starts off with grace be to you. What is he doing? Don't forget how you were saved. Don't forget what you have received. Don't forget how you are to live this Christian life. They taught the people. The people that were coming in and trying to change God's word, they were teaching people something outside of grace. You know what they were doing? Oh yeah, we believe in grace. Oh yeah, we believe in grace. Amen for grace. Thank God for grace. Amazing grace. They weren't singing that song back then because they didn't have it. But if they would have, they would have sung it. And then right behind it, they would have said, But don't forget, you need to. And then they would have given some other things like circumcision. So don't forget grace. We love grace. Amen for grace. But don't forget, you need this. Folks, when you attach anything, anything to grace, it is no longer grace. Do you realize that? It doesn't matter what it is. Oh, preacher, but we love it when our church does that. Great. Does it have anything to do with grace or are you talking about tradition? I'm all for tradition. We love traditions in our home. We love doing certain things around Christmas. I don't know if you have uh, uh, Christmas traditions in your home. We most certainly have uh, traditions uh, 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 at Christmas time in our home. But I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't make our Christmas. If we don't get to do those uh, traditions, if we don't get a Christmas tree, guess what? I'm still going to celebrate the birth of Christ. Are you with me now? If I don't get a present, my feelings may be hurt. But I'm not going to die because I don't get another present. I got the greatest gift of all. And his name is Jesus Christ. My friend, I'm going to tell you something. Those rudiments of the world, I'm all for celebrating those things. And I think they're all good and dandy. But let's not mix it with grace, okay? Let's not do that. And that's what Paul is doing here. He is trying to defend that and let them know, hold on, hold on. Folks, we got to stay in the grace period. We got to stay in our zone. We got to stay in our lane. And so Paul was helping with that. And these false teachers were having good success. And I want you to know that there are false teachers even in our age today. And they are having good big success a filthy lucre Paul says Paul said that they would like to make merchandise of you you know what that means they are going to get wealthy off of your dollar see how does that happen I'll tell you how it happens because they'll smooth it over with good music and I like good music but my grandmother's dead and gone. I love her, miss her. And she was a godly woman, saved woman. But she would give to the Jimmy Swaggered ministry because she loved that man singing. Now listen, there is no doubt that God 
used that man at one point in time. But Paul even mentions that he had fallen out of grace when he decided to go along with some prostitution and was found guilty. That man fell out of grace. And let me tell you something. Listen to me. Well, while you may think that music's great, and listen, they, they have the best of the best when it comes to music programs. I mean, they can sing a song 40 times in a row. And then people waving them hankies and giving them dollar bills. Let me tell you something. There ain't but one reason why they got to have all them share thons and why they got to have Bible thon, August thon, and, and, and September thon, and, and October thon. They got to raise all this money on tape because they are in debt up to their eyeballs and they need you to pay it. There ain't but one reason why they're in debt it's because man put them there. God didn't put them there. And don't you forget it, there are those, there are wolves in sheep's clothing that will try to make merchandise of you. I'm not saying there isn't some truth mixed into it, but you have to know your Bible. And you can't take the chance just because it's on a Christian station that they are of God. These people were in the church. These people were in a newly planted church. They were in a church that the Apostle Paul planted. And yet, they were being divisive and teaching false doctrine. My friend, if it happened in Paul's day, it happens in ours. More freely. We got to be Bible students and know our Bible. And we don't have to have PhDs. We don't have to go to Bible college. You just need to know your Bible. And know your Bible well enough to know that doesn't bear witness with my spirit. And my friend, if we, look, listen, if we all have the Spirit of God in us, shouldn't we be in unison? Shouldn't we be in agreement? And how come our spirit doesn't bear witness with that spirit? I'm going to tell you why, because it's the wrong spirit. Listen, ministries have monetary needs. I don't know a church that doesn't. But there will be some that will come in and will easily, easily try to manipulate and, and try to force and change the way they do it. And by the way, they'll slap Jesus all on the bumper sticker. That does not make it from the Lord. See, what I want you to know tonight, the Scriptures not only reveal doctrine, but it, again, like I said to you, it also reproves and corrects. And what Paul is doing here, he is correcting these believers now for failure to believe and live by the doctrine they have been taught. So you may have heard at times, and people don't know how to phrase stuff sometimes oh boy sometimes the pastor needs to shear the sheep well my friend I understand that while I appreciate that it is Jesus who does the correcting but it might be the spokesperson who does it through his word no pastor has any business shearing the sheep I'm going to tell you something I won't stand before God for one reason that you choose to live godly or don't live godly. That is all you. But I will stand before God for what I have done with His Word before you. Then once this is heralded and once this is given, it is all in your court. And Paul was making sure that these believers understand, hey, hey, Come on now. Let's get back to where we began. Let's get back. Let's get back to our foundation now. Sheep are loved by their shepherd. They are cared for by their shepherd. While he may need to lovingly correct, it should always be done, listen, through the Bible now. Not because of our preferences, not because of what 
we may like over one thing or another. Listen, if it can't be found in this, just move on. Just move on. Doctrinal, doctrinal and moral, moral failure. Doctrinal and moral failure cannot be tolerated in the church. Because the Bible lets us know that just a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It only takes a little bit of yeast to make the thing blow up. Do you know that? It only takes a little. And the Bible references this, that leaven represents corruption that spreads. I want Vernon to read a couple verses to you now. You just plug in and listen. <coughs> Say, what does this have to do with the book of Galatians? Everything about the purity of the Word of God. Everything about your life. Because as a believer, your life is based on the Bible, isn't it? Shouldn't it be? And if it is, you can't take a chance on half-truths. You can't live by non-truths. You can't live by that. You have to live and must live if you're going to live victorious now. If you're going to live any way you want to willy-nilly, then just do your own thing and forget about this book. But if you have any desire to live like Christ and to represent Christ in a holy manner and live with power of God on your life and live in a manner that is pleasing and honoring to Jesus Christ, then there's some things you must do. And one of the things that you must do is to live a life that's absolutely pure even with what you take into your spirit. Not just in your flesh, not just by what you listen or watch on TV, but what you feed yourself spiritually. Man, if you keep putting junk physically in your body, it's going to show up in you physically. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What is going to help you and I live that in a way is pleasing and honoring and absolutely bringing God glory to our life? I'm going to tell you something. It ain't faithfulness to church. Although that's important, it ain't the first thing. You can't make, listen to me, you can't convince a carnal Christian that they need to be in church. You can't do it. By the way, you don't have to do it to someone who's living godly. They'll show up. They'll be here. You don't have to do it. They'll have a drawing. They'll have, they'll, they'll have a desire and a wantonness to want to be where the people of God are. So I'm just letting you know, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Notice and hear this verse that's being read. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. And your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? How much sin does it take to make you a sinner? How... How many? Just how many sins? How many? Wow, no S. How many sin does it take? Just one. Well, one ain't two. One ain't plural. One is singular. Just one sin. How many of you right now, honestly, think think that you could relect, re recollect every sin you've ever done. How many of you think you could absolutely recollect every sin you've ever done? <laughs> none of you. None of me. I, there's no way. What, 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 what if I miss one? Is that possible? People, people do some crazy things in the Christian realm now. Oh, brother, you need to repent of all your sins. Now listen, 
See, words don't matter. Don't tell me they don't matter. They do matter. Oh, brother, you need to repent of all your sins. Listen, there's some stuff that I haven't done yet. How am I going to re repent of sins I had not even done yet? How am I going to remember every sin? What if I forget one? Now what? See, we still want to put the responsibility on man. No, my friend. You just turn to Christ in faith. And you let him do the forgiving. You let him do all the recollecting. By the way, he will. But then as soon as he recollect it, the Bible says he chooses to remember them no more. <laughs> I can't remember them if I try. Because there's so many of them. There's no way I'm going to remember them. I thank God for the total assurance of God's faithfulness and complete forgiveness in my life. That I'm not having to remember every little thing I've ever done in my whole life. That Jesus has all of that washed through the blood shed on the cross of Calvary. I thank God for that. But I'm going to tell you something. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Let me tell you. If I tell you, if I tell you nine out of ten truths, but I tell you nine out of ten, but one of them is not a truth, and I don't, I'm not numbering them one through ten, but nine out of them are truth, but one of them is not a truth. Listen, have I been honest with you? Yes or no? Would you consider me honest? Yes or no? Why? Because I've lied. You have 66 books. What if just one of the books is a lie? Can you take any of this as truth? No, sir. Then God is it. Some of you don't know how to answer. Absolutely you cannot. Because God would then be fallible. He would be in error and inconsistent. And he wouldn't be holy. All of this is pure and true. Every bit of it. Even the things I don't like to hear. Even the things I don't understand. Even the things I haven't learned yet. It's still true. That is why this is so important to make sure it's not corrupted. And they're going to keep coming out. Listen to me now. And I'm not going to get off on a rabbit trail. But they're going to continue to come out with all types of of corrupted translations of this book. Now I'm not going to get into all that tonight, but I should at some point in time with you. They're going to keep coming up with all that. One, because it makes money. They got to make money. They, 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 they got to come up with something new all the time. But I'm going to tell you another reason why they're doing it, and it's more important, and it's, more, it's worse than their money. They're going to try to turn this into a lie. They're going to change this to, to make the deity and the holiness and the purity of God's word go away. They're going to do it. By the way, they've been doing it for hundreds of years and no one wants to pay attention to it. No one wants to listen to that. We've bought into lie. Well, I can't understand that language. You don't understand English? Yes, you do. I know we fumble and, and, and fall over words. I do it all the time. I do it just trying to speak English. And can't get all my words right out of my mouth. Folks, this ain't my problem. I'll tell you where my problem is. It's up here. I don't want to do what it says. I can't take any leaven. I can't take any leaven. Why? Because it corrupts the whole thing. Now listen to this verse. It comes out of Galatians 5, 9. Listen to this. Nice and loud, Brother Vernon. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Say, I, you just read that. I know Paul's consistent in his writings, and so should he be. What is he doing? Trying to protect the doctrinal and integrity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Doctrinal corruption spreads but it also produces moral corruption let me tell you something 
you start making this into a lie and you start changing this to fit your to accommodate your lifestyle see God has made this book so your life will come into accommodation to this book not this book to be accommodating of your lifestyle and when we start to change this book there will become more heresies and Christian and moral failure and decay in the size the society all because of one reason we got away from this book that's why so I want you to listen to this verse it comes out of 1 Corinthians 15 33 nice and loud brother Jeremy be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners be not deceived evil communication corrupts good manners there used to be and by the way it came from church there used to be a thing called good manners I'm talking about where respect was taught you say yeah oh yes sir no sir no man you call them mister and missus oh they don't have to call me mister okay when did you decide that we could let go of having good manners and if a parent still wants to teach that you let them teach it don't correct them but I'm gonna tell you all that it comes we start compromising and I've said this many times over small compromises lead to big disasters it's small it always starts off small always why Satan doesn't want to give the whole thing at once because then it is obvious this is a terrible illustration but I'm gonna tell you because you're gonna get it no one immediately becomes naked and commits fornication it always starts with one article at a time the process is always sneaky and manipulative it always starts with one thing and that's why I believe men and ladies ought to be modest that's why I believe in that it is never the young ladies fault it's never the boys fault it's our own choice of what we do but little compromises now listen little compromises lead to big disasters you keep the little girls dressed up and you keep them covered up why because there is a corrupt pervert out there that will take advantage of that little girl a and you never get it back let me tell you something there have been many many people who have never ever gotten back their spiritual health and the power of God back on their life because they had one decision of choosing to let a little leaven leaven in the whole lot just one God takes sin serious. Matter of fact, He takes it so serious that it is the integrity of His Word that eradicates it and puts a desire inside the believer to only want holiness in their life and not sin. The only thing that will produce that, not is, not, it's not more preaching about it. It's getting to know the Word of God getting rooted in this this is what will keep us pure and holy there's another verse I want you to hear about how doctrinal corruption when we corrupt the Word of God produces moral corruption so one thing leads to it's a domino effect it comes out of second Timothy 2 15 through 18 nice and loud brother Jeremy study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness 
and their word will eat, as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who, concerning the truth, have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. This was so serious about how false teaching had come in and the corruptness of God's word come in. Paul names the individuals. Paul calls them out. He said, man, this thing eats like a canker worm. This thing gets in and you don't know it. And it doesn't reveal itself until there is so much void and absence. It's, it's too late to recover. This thing, when it rears its head, takes so much to eradicate and remove and clean up. That's why it's important about the absolute preservation of God's Word. See, sound doctrine produces godliness when it's truly believed. Listen to this verse, and then I want to read Galatians 1.4 to you. Listen to this verse. It comes out of Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. That is such an incredible verse. Do you know what a student of God's word produces? Godliness. A hunger for his word will produce godliness in you. Oh, preacher, but I struggle. You need more of this? Oh, but... I find myself doing good for a while, but then I just kind of go back and, and, I, and, I, and I struggle. I, I do good for a month and I, I do bad for a month. You, you're missing this. I, I assure you. I absolutely assure you. You have never sinned while in this book. I have, listen, I have never run across someone who has decided that they're going to sin. I'm talking about outward, I'm talking about corrupt stuff while they're having a Bible study. While they're reading this book and letting this book get in them. I've never run across that individual. And I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm not saying someone can't forcibly do that. But I'm going to tell you this. The Bible says Paul just told us that the acknowledging of the truth produces godliness in the believer. That's why Paul is fighting what's happening in Galatia. Now I want you to look at verse 4 now of Galatians 1. <coughs> While you're there, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.17... For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Of God we speak, we in Christ. Paul said we're not as many which corrupt the word of God. This whole thing is about defending the word of God and staying true. And here in verse 3, we know it's about grace it's no longer about the sin question. It is the son question, capital S-O-N. We know that those who absolutely remain unreconciled to God is because they have rejected Christ and his redemptive work. Now, verse 4. Let's plow some new field. Verse 4. Who? Well... Who does it refer? Who is the who referring to? Well, right at the end of verse 3, Lord Jesus Christ, who? There is not really a punctuation there. It is a continuation. The Lord Jesus Christ, who? Gave himself, himself Christ, for our sins, 
that he, Christ, might deliver us, that's you and me, from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. It is the will of God for you and I to live victorious in this present world. Now, you may not think you can, but you can. You absolutely can. Yes, sir, you can. And this verse explains to us what Jesus did, but why he did it too. What he did and why he did it. And in your handout, the only reason that grace and peace of verse 3 can be offered is because Christ gave himself for our sins. Let me tell you, and it's already filled in. I'm not even going to read the verses because we've done it last time. Notice about Christ's sacrifice. Number one, it was voluntary. It was voluntary. Christ gave himself willingly. We read those verses. There's one in your handout. The other ones we read last week. Not going to do it tonight. Number two or the second dot. Christ's sacrifice was offered out of complete submission to the will of the Father. It is God's will. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's what Jesus said. My, my. Jesus, the Holy One, deity. He was all human. He was all man, but he was all God. He himself said, no, Father, what you want, I'll do. Not my will, but your will. Well, I have some work to do then myself i got to submit to the will of the Father. In other words, we got to be obedient. Are you here tonight? All right, we've got to be obedient. And then listen to this one. This next one's really good. Vernon, go to Galatians 2.20. While he's going to Galatians 2.20, everybody write this in. Christ's sacrifice was given out of love. L-O-V-E. Love. Oh, you don't know nothing about no love. You're too young to know anything about love. That's what older people tell young people. And they're right. Well, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I don't think Christians know much about love either. Yep, that's we, we have to learn this from God. He is love. He is the epitome of love. He, he is the embodiment of love. <coughs> we wouldn't know how to love except God loved us first, right? Man, the Bible lines all this up for us. I, you know, we got a lot of learning to do. We still have some growing to do. Now listen to this verse. What Christ did, he did out of love. Galatians 2.20, you know it, but you listen to it as Vernon reads that nice and loud. I am crucified with Christ. Yes. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. Who and what? Gave Wait a minute. What did he me. say? Loved me. He what, Vernon? He loved me. He loved me. How many of you were around when Galatians 2.20 was written? None of you. How many of you were around when Christ went to the cross? None of you. If you would have been there at Calvary, watching the whole thing displayed, it doesn't matter if it's a person who hasn't even born yet or was already born and died before Calvary. Christ loved you. This whole thing is about love. This thing is not about God just trying to put his thumb on me. He's just so hard. He just so mean. No, no, no. He's so loving. You got the wrong word in there. He's so loving. This whole thing is about loving. I tell you what, let's hang you on the cross and let's talk about love. See, that's, separate. that's the difference though, isn't it? He went voluntarily. He was doing it for the will of the Father. I, I'm going to fight you every bit of the way. I, one, I don't need to go there. But number two, it ain't going to feel all that good. I'm going to have a hard time seeing love in this. I'm going to see this as, you're just mean and nasty and violent. Jesus didn't see it that way. While we know the cross was violent, man, the crucifixion was brutal. Man, bloody, painful. The whole time. Wherein he, say it Vernon, he loved 
me. Go ahead and finish it. And gave himself. He did it because he loved me. Look at it now. He, lo he, he did it because he loved you. Now listen, go look at verse 4 now back at Galatians 1. And notice, notice back in verse 4. It says, who gave himself, himself for our sins. H hold it, hold it. Did, not a trick question. Did Christ give himself for us and our sins because he saw how good we were? <laughs> Sometimes we like to think we're a little better than we are, right? I'm not too bad. Well, Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. I, deliver? Yeah, I needed rescuing. Well, you don't rescue those who don't need deliverance. You don't do that. You, you know what? Was it because somehow we were going to get better on our own? Is that why Christ, he just, he knew we were just going, well, eventually they'll get it and get better on their own. How, how many know we're going to get better on our own? No, we're not going to get better on our own. We're going to get worse on our own. That's the best, that's the best I got to offer. I don't guess there's such a word as worser. <laughs> yeah, worser. You, you'll be more worse. I don't even know if that's right. I, I, I'll just stop. No. What does the Bible say? Because that's what's important. Christ gave himself because of his love for us. Notice what it said. He, Christ, gave himself for our, our personal possessive pronoun. Don't know if you know that now. Personal possessive. In other words, I own it. Here's what I own. Here's what I bring to the table. Not goodness. Not righteousness. Sin. That's what I bring. Now remember now, as I'm about to close and, 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 and pack up, God is a holy God and He cannot condone sin. You know that, right? You know that. And we can't forget that. Ever forget it. We cannot ever forget that about God. Because when you forget that about God, then you start believing that maybe there's something else other than grace. Because when you forget about his love and you forget that he doesn't condone sin what what you start to do is you think that you can do something on your own and that you've arrived and and God just will let you do anything that you choose to do that's not true see we know that his character is one of holiness now if Christ is in you and you have received Christ and you belong to him and you and I, the Bible says, are united. We're made one with Christ. We're made one. We have become in union with Christ. Then, shouldn't the character that is of God be in you and me? Shouldn't the character of God flow through us? Now, I don't know if you know anything about flowing. But you can dam up some water and keep it from flowing. And Christians are like a lot of beavers. They're too busy gnawing at everything else and just damming up the flow to keep God's spirit and his power and his character flowing through them because they're too busy trying to meddle and repair and do everything that they're not supposed to do instead of just resting in God's book. I kind of picture it like this. Now there's no doubt that we ought to we ought to have good works. Now, but I kind of think of it like this. While the seas may get rocky, I can still sit in my lounge chair with my feet up because Jesus is the captain of the boat. I don't have to wear my little swim things on my arms, you know, them little I don't know what them things are called, but you can't get them on unless they get wet or they're just going to rip every piece of skin you have off. 
you know, put them things on floaties. I don't have to wear my life vest. I don't have to put on my, uh, my, my little, uh, what's that round thing? Huh? No, what's that thing you throw out? All right, stop it. Anyway, I don't have to worry about all that stuff. I can just rest in the sufficiency of my Savior. Most Christians don't want to live that way with their feet propped up. They want to go back to the principle, now I've got to keep myself saved. No, you just need to live saved. Jesus is the keeper of your salvation. Stop trying to be the beaver. And just allow His power, His Word, to flow through you. And yes, sin must be judged. We know the penalty of sin, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We know that. And yes, God can't excuse it. God can't ignore it. Because if He does, then He's contrary to Himself. He, he, he would be the opposite to His own attributes. But God is the judge who passed the sentences on us, yet He stepped off of His throne and took the penalty Himself. He didn't do something that's contrary to who He is. He actually did what He is. And that is the righteous judge. He Himself, the only one who could ever pay the debt and pay the penalty, stood before us and took our penalty. Folks, that's grace be unto you. That's the beauty of this whole thing. And Paul was saying, wait a minute. He could squash you like a bug. But he doesn't. Because he doesn't want to. It's not because he can't. Because he doesn't want to. And I love that. Oh, preacher, I used to be a, I used to be a brawler, and boy, I used to get knock them out left and right. Boy, I used to love to fight. Really? How about now? No, I don't want to. I just want to love people. Well, you're a big teddy bear. Yeah, I cry, and it don't take much to make me weak now. I used to be the meanest, hateful person. You know what that is? That's the grace of God in someone's life. Took that old rotten, mean person. That's just an example. How in the world does that happen? It's not because that person changed themselves. It's because they no longer desired it. They can be that person. By the way, they can go back to that. They can go do that. They sure can. They can be a heathen just like the rest of them. But they no longer desire that. You... It, shouldn't that be us, church? We no longer desire those things. We no longer desire to lie. I want to be a truth teller, don't you? Why, my Jesus is a truth teller. I want to be a representation of Him. Now, I can lie. I just don't want to. I can. I don't want to. I, I'm choosing not to want to do those things. Because it doesn't please the Lord. And there's enough power within me now not to have to sin. Paul said that sin may no more have dominion over you. While I'm still in the presence of sin, I don't have to live under the power of sin. I have a different power source. Are you with me now? That's what Paul's getting at. All this matters. All this comes together. All through this one thing though. And I close. The pureness and sincerity and holiness of His Word. Don't change the book. Can't change the teaching of this. No matter how hard it is or how soft it is at times. And we like the soft times. But when it gets hard, and when these things are hard, I still need to be ready to receive it. Why? Because it produces godliness, Paul said in Titus 1.1. This is what it produces. And, and church, listen, believer, you should desire holiness and godliness in your life. Well, here's the thing. There's no way to produce it except through this. This is the only thing that will produce it in you. 
If not, you, you'll still get rotten. You'll become rotten. You'll be a rotten Christian. You'll be a sour Christian. You'll be a mean Christian. A lying Christian. You say, oh, Brother Larry, how can a Christian do those things? Because Christians still can sin. But it was, it's their choice. But you don't have to. This is the very thing that keeps my appetite suppressed for sin. This is God's, listen, this is God's dietary plan for the Christian. Okay? Now I'm not talking about physical food, I'm talking about spiritual food. When you keep eating of this, you want less of what the world wants to feed you. And by the way, the world will feed you. And by the way, they'll make you fat. They'll make you fat. They will absolutely blow you up and make you feel that you're just, you've arrived and you, you'll just be happy for a moment. See, this is the only thing that will suppress that appetite where you will no longer want that type of food. No longer want to hear that cursing. That GD will just crawl you, and when you hear it, you you want to take up arms and fight something. Oh, you took my daddy's name in vain. Did you talk about my dad? It'll bother you. But the more you eat of the world's food, you'll hear that stuff. You won't eat, it won't matter. You won't even hear it. And someone will say, did you hear that? And you'll be like, no. What'd they say? Spiritually speaking, your ears ought to just be like radar and just go, boop, boop, bad signal. Can't be around that. It doesn't mean you make everyone an enemy. It just means, thank God that he has put my heart in tune spiritually. To help me live under godliness. That's what Paul was fighting for. And that's what he's fighting for in the church. And that's what we need to fight for too. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the Bible study. This week, may we fight the good fight of faith. Holding on and laying hold of eternal truths. The word of God. May we spend more time in your word this week. And may it dwell in us richly. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless you.